History of England, Chapter Thirteen, Part Five. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of England from the Accession of James the Second, by Thomas Babington Macaulay, Chapter Thirteen, Part Five. The arrival of Mackay's troops and the determination of Gordon to remain inactive quelled the spirit of the Jacobites. They had indeed one chance left. They might possibly, by joining with those Whigs who were bent on an union with England, have postponed during a considerable time the settlement of the government. A negotiation was actually opened with this view, but was speedily broken off. For it soon appeared that the party which was for James was really hostile to the Union, and that the party which was for the Union was really hostile to James. As these two parties had no object in common, the only effect of a coalition between them must have been that one of them would have become the tool of the other. The question of the Union, therefore, was not raised. Some Jacobites retired to their country seats. Others, though they remained at Edinburgh, ceased to show themselves in the Parliament House. Many passed over to the winning side, and, when at length the resolutions prepared by the twenty-four were submitted to the Convention, it appeared that the party which, on the first day of the session, had rallied around Athol, had dwindled away to nothing. The resolutions had been framed, as far as possible, in conformity with the example recently set at Westminster. In one important point, however, it was absolutely necessary that the copy should deviate from the original. The estates of England had brought two charges against James, his misgovernment and his flight, and had, by using the soft word abdication, evaded, with some sacrifice of verbal precision, the question whether subjects may lawfully depose a bad prince. That question the estates of Scotland could not evade. They could not pretend that James had deserted his post, for he had never, since he came to the throne, resided in Scotland. During many years that kingdom had been ruled by sovereigns who dwelt in another land. The whole machinery of the administration had been constructed on the supposition that the king would be absent, and was therefore not necessarily deranged by that flight which had, in the south of the island, dissolved all government, and suspended the ordinary course of justice." It was only by letter that the King could, when he was at Whitehall, communicate with the Council and the Parliament at Edinburgh, and by letter he could communicate with them when he was at St. Germain's, or at Dublin. The twenty-four were therefore forced to propose to the Estates a resolution distinctly declaring that James the Seventh had, by his misconduct, forfeited the crown. Many writers have inferred from the language of this resolution that sound political principles had made a greater progress in Scotland than in England. But the whole history of the two countries, from the Restoration to the Union, proves this inference to be erroneous. The Scottish estates used plain language, simply because it was impossible for them, situated as they were, to use evasive language. The person who bore the chief part in framing the resolution, and in defending it, was Sir John Dalrymple, who had recently held the high office of Lord Advocate, and had been an accomplice in some of the misdeeds which he now arraigned with great force of reasoning and eloquence. He was strenuously supported by Sir James Montgomery, member for Ayrshire, a man of considerable abilities, but of loose principles, turbulent temper, insatiable cupidity, and implacable malevolence. The Archbishop of Glasgow and Sir George Mackenzie spoke on the other side, but the only effect of their oratory was to deprive their party of the advantage of being able to allege that the estates were under duress, and that the liberty of speech had been denied to the defenders of hereditary monarchy. When the question was put, Athol, Queensbury, and some of their friends withdrew. Only five members voted against the resolution, which pronounced that James had forfeited his right to the allegiance of his subjects. When it was moved that the crown of Scotland should be settled as the crown of England had been settled, Athol and Queensbury reappeared in the hall. They had doubted, they said, whether they could justifiably declare the throne vacant. But since it had been declared vacant, they felt no doubt that William and Mary were the persons who ought to fill it. The convention then went forth in procession to the high street. Several great nobles, attended by the Lord Provost of the capital and by the heralds, 
ascended the octagon tower from which rose the city cross, surmounted by the unicorn of Scotland. Hamilton read the vote of the convention, and a king-at-arms proclaimed the new sovereigns with a sound of trumpet. On the same day the estates issued an order that the parochial clergy should, on pain of deprivation, publish from their pulpits the proclamation which had just been read at the city cross, and should pray for King William and Queen Mary. Still the interregnum was not at an end. Though the new sovereigns had been proclaimed, they had not yet been put into possession of the royal authority, by a formal tender and a formal acceptance. At Edinburgh, as at Westminster, it was thought necessary that the instrument which settled the government should clearly define and solemnly assert those privileges of the people which the Stuarts had illegally infringed. A claim of right was therefore drawn up by the twenty-four, and adopted by the convention. To this claim, which purported to be merely declaratory of the law as it stood, was added a supplementary paper containing a list of grievances, which could be remedied only by new laws. One most important article, which we should naturally expect to find at the head of such a list, the convention, with great practical prudence, put in defiance of notorious facts and of unanswerable arguments, placed in the claim of right. Nobody could deny that prelacy was established by act of Parliament. The power exercised by the bishops might be pernicious, unscriptural, anti-Christian, but illegal it certainly was not, and to pronounce it illegal was to outrage common sense. The Whig leaders, however, were much more desirous to get rid of episcopacy than to prove themselves consummate publicists and logicians. If they made the abolition of episcopacy an article of the contract by which William was to hold the crown, they attained their end, though doubtless in a manner open to much criticism. If, on the other hand, they contented themselves with resolving that episcopacy was a noxious institution, which at some future time the legislature would do well to abolish, they might find that their resolution, though unobjectionable in form, was barren of consequences. They knew that William by no means sympathized with their dislike of bishops, and that, even had he been much more zealous for the Calvinistic model than he was, the relation in which he stood to the Anglican Church would make it difficult and dangerous for him to declare himself hostile to a fundamental part of the constitution of that church. If he should become King of Scotland, without being fettered by any pledge on this subject, it might well be apprehended that he would hesitate about passing an act which would be regarded with abhorrence by a large body of his subjects in the south of the island. It was therefore most desirable that the question should be settled while the throne was still vacant. In this opinion many politicians concurred, who had no dislike to rochets and meters, but who wished that William might have a quiet and prosperous reign. The Scottish people, so these men reasoned, hated episcopacy. The English loved it. To leave William any voice in the matter was to put him under the necessity of deeply wounding the strongest feelings of one of the nations which he governed. It was therefore plainly for his own interest that the question, which he could not settle in any manner without incurring a fearful amount of obloquy, should be settled for him by others who were exposed to no such danger. He was not yet sovereign of Scotland. While the interregnum lasted, the supreme power belonged to the estates, and, for what the estates might do, the prelatist of his southern kingdom could not hold him responsible. The elder Dalrymple wrote strongly from London to this effect, and there can be little doubt that he expressed the sentiments of his master. William would have sincerely rejoiced if the Scots could have been reconciled to a modified episcopacy. But, since that could not be, it was manifestly desirable that they should themselves, while there was yet no king over them, pronounce the irrevocable doom of the institution which they abhorred. The convention, therefore, with little debate, as it should seem, inserted in the claim of right a cause declaring that prelacy was an insupportable burden to the kingdom, that it had been long odious to the body of the people, and that it ought to be abolished. Nothing in the proceedings at Edinburgh astonished an Englishman more than the manner in which the estates dealt with the practice of torture. In England torture had always been illegal. In the most servile times the judges had unanimously pronounced it so those rulers who had occasionally resorted to it had, as far as was possible, used it in secret, had never pretended that they had acted in conformity with either statute law or common law, 
and had excused themselves by saying that the extraordinary peril to which the state was exposed had forced them to take on themselves the responsibility of employing extraordinary means of defence. It had, therefore, never been thought necessary by any English Parliament to pass any act or resolution touching this matter. The torture was not mentioned in the Petition of Right, or in any of the statutes framed by the Long Parliament. No member of the Convention of 1689 dreamed of proposing that the instrument, which called the Prince and Princess of Orange to the throne, should contain a declaration against the using of racks and thumbscrews for the purpose of forcing prisoners to accuse themselves. Such a declaration would have been justly regarded as weakening rather than strengthening a rule which, as far back as the days of the Plantagenets, had been proudly declared by the most illustrious sages of Westminster Hall to be a distinguishing feature of the English jurisprudence. In the Scottish claim of right, the use of torture without evidence, or in any ordinary cases, was declared to be contrary to law. The use of torture, therefore, where there was strong evidence and where the crime was extraordinary, was, by the plainest implication, declared to be according to law. Nor did the estates mention the use of torture among the grievances which required a legislative remedy. In truth, they could not condemn the use of torture without condemning themselves. It had chanced that, while they were employed in settling the government, the eloquent and learned Lord President Lockhart had been foully murdered in a public street, through which he was returning from church on a Sunday. The murderer was seized, and proved to be a wretch who, having treated his wife barbarously and turned her out of doors, had been compelled by a decree of the Court of Session to provide for her. A savage hatred of the judges by whom she had been protected had taken possession of his mind, and had goaded him to a horrible crime and a horrible fate. It was natural that an assassination attended by so many circumstances of aggravation should move the indignation of the members of the Convention. Yet they should have considered the gravity of the conjecture and the importance of their own mission. They unfortunately, in the heat of passion, directed the magistrates of Edinburgh to strike the prisoner in the boots, and named a committee to superintend the operation. But for this unhappy event, it is probable that the law of Scotland concerning torture would have been immediately assimilated to the law of England. Having settled the claim of right, the Convention proceeded to revise the coronation oath. When this had been done, three members were appointed to carry the instrument of government to London. Argyle, though not in strictness of law a peer, was chosen to represent the peers. Sir James Montgomery represented the commissioners of shires, and Sir John Dalrymple the commissioners of towns. The estates then adjourned for a few weeks, having first passed a vote which empowered Hamilton to take such measures as might be necessary for the preservation of the public peace, till the end of the interregnum. The ceremony of the inauguration was distinguished from ordinary pageants by some highly interesting circumstances. On the 11th of May the three commissioners came to the council chamber at Whitehall, and thence, attended by almost all the Scotchmen of note who were then in London, proceeded to the banqueting-house. There William and Mary appeared seated under a canopy. A splendid circle of English nobles, and statesmen, stood round the throne, but the sword of state, as committed to a Scotch lord, and the oath of office was administered after the Scotch fashion. Argyle recited the words slowly. The royal pair, holding up their hands towards heaven, repeated after him till they came to the last clause. There William paused. That clause contained a promise that he would root out all heretics and enemies of the true worship of God, and it was notorious that, in the opinion of many Scotchmen, not only all Roman Catholics, but all Protestant Episcopalians, all Independents, all Baptists and Quakers, all Lutherans, nay, all British Presbyterians, who did not hold themselves bound by the Solemn League and Covenant, were enemies of the true worship of God. The King had apprised the Commissioners that he could not take this part of the oath without a distinct and public explanation, and they had been authorized by the Convention to give such an explanation as would satisfy him. I will not, he now said, lay myself under any obligation to be a persecutor. Neither the words of this oath, said one of the commissioners, nor the laws of Scotland, lay any such obligation on your majesty. In that sense, then, I swear, said William, and desire you all, my lords and gentlemen, to witness that I do so. 
Even his detractors have generally admitted that on this great occasion he acted with uprightness, dignity, and wisdom. As King of Scotland, he soon found himself embarrassed at every step by all the difficulties which had embarrassed him as King of England, and by other difficulties which in England were happily unknown. In the north of the island, no class was more dissatisfied with the revolution than the class which owed most to the revolution. The manner in which the convention had decided the question of ecclesiastical polity had not been more offensive to the bishops themselves than to those fiery covenanters who had long, in defiance of sword and carbine, boot and gibbet, worshipped their maker after their own fashion, in caverns and on mountain-tops. Was there ever, these zealots exclaimed, such a halting between two opinions, such a compromise between the Lord and Baal? The estates ought to have said that episcopacy was an abomination in God's sight, and that, in obedience to his word, and from fear of his righteous judgment, they were determined to deal with this great national sin and scandal after the fashion of those saintly rulers, who of old cut down the groves and demolished the altars of Chemus and Astarte. Unhappily Scotland was ruled not by pious Josiahs, but by careless Galois. The anti-Christian hierarchy was to be abolished, not because it was an insult to heaven, but because it was felt as a burden on earth, not because it was hateful to the great head of the church, but because it was hateful to the people. Was public opinion, then, the test of right and wrong in religion? Was not the order which Christ had established in his own house to be held equally sacred in all countries and through all ages? And was there no reason for following that order in Scotland, except a reason which might be urged with equal force for maintaining prelacy in England, popery in Spain, and Mohammedism in Turkey? Why, too, was nothing said of those covenants which the nation had so generally subscribed and so generally violated? Why was it not distinctly affirmed that the premises set down in those rolls were still binding, and would to the end of time be binding, on the kingdom? Were these truths to be suppressed from regard for the feelings and interests of a prince who was all things to all men, an ally of the idolatrous Spaniard and of the Lutheran Bane, a Presbyterian at the Hague and a prelatist at Whitehall? He, like Jelen in ancient times, had doubtless so far done well that he had been the scourge of the idolatrous house of Ahab. But he, like Jelen, had not taken heed to walk in the divine law with his whole heart, but had tolerated and practised impieties differing only in degree from those which he had declared himself the enemy. It would have better become godly senators to remonstrate with him on the sin which he was committing by conforming to the Anglican ritual, and by maintaining the Anglican church government, than to flatter him by using a phraseology which seemed to indicate that they were as deeply tainted with Erastianism as himself. Many of those who held this language refused to do any act which could be construed into a recognition of the new sovereigns, and would rather have been fired upon by files of musketeers, or tied to stakes within low water mark, than have uttered a prayer that God would bless William and Mary. Yet the king had less to fear from the pernicious adherence of these men to their absurd principles, than from the ambition and avarice of another set of men who had no principles at all. It was necessary that he should immediately name ministers to conduct the government of Scotland, and, name who he might, he could not fail to disappoint and irritate a multitude of expectants. Scotland was one of the least wealthy countries in Europe, yet no country in Europe contained a greater number of clever and selfish politicians. The places in the gift of the crown were not enough to satisfy one-twentieth part of the place-hunters, every one of whom thought that his own services had been preeminent, and that whoever might be passed by he ought to be remembered. William did his best to satisfy these innumerable and insatiable claimants by putting many offices into commission. There were, however, a few great posts which it was impossible to divide. Hamilton was declared Lord High Commissioner, in the hope that immense pecuniary allowances, a residence in Holyrood Palace, and a pomp and dignity little less than regal would content him. The Earl of Crawford was appointed President of the Parliament, and it was supposed that this appointment would conciliate the rigid Presbyterians, for Crawford was what they called a professor. His letters and speeches are, to use his own phraseology, exceedingly savoury. 
Alone, or almost alone, among the prominent politicians of that time, he retained the style which had been fashionable in the preceding generation. He had a text of the Old Testament ready for every occasion. He filled his dispatches with allusions to Ishmael and Hagar, Hannah and Eli, Elijah, Nehemiah, and Zerubbabel, and adorned his oratory with quotations from Ezra and Haggai. It is a circumstance strikingly characteristic of the man, and of the school in which he had been trained, that in all the mass of his writing which has come down to us, there is not a single word indicating that he had ever in his life heard of the New Testament. Even in our own time some persons of a peculiar taste have been so much delighted by the rich unction of his eloquence, that they have confidently pronounced him a saint." To those whose habit it is to judge of a man rather by his actions than by his words, Crawford will appear to have been a selfish, cruel politician, who was not at all the dupe of his own cant, and whose zeal against Episcopal government was not a little wedded by his desire to obtain a grant of Episcopal domains. In excuse for his greediness, it ought to be said that he was the poorest noble of a poor nobility and that before the revolution he was sometimes at a loss for a meal and a suit of clothes. End of chapter 13, part 5the History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay, Chapter Thirteen, Part Six. The ablest of Scottish politicians and debaters, Sir John Dalrymple, was appointed Lord Advocate. His father, Sir James, the greatest of Scottish jurists, was placed at the head of the Court of Session. Sir William Lockhart, a man whose letters prove him to have possessed considerable ability, became Solicitor General. Sir James Montgomery had flattered himself that he should be the chief minister. He had distinguished himself highly in the convention. He had been one of the commissioners who had tendered the crown and administered the oath to the new sovereigns. In parliamentary ability and eloquence he had no superior among his countrymen except the new Lord Advocate. The secretaryship was, not indeed in dignity, but in real power, the highest office in the new Scottish government and this office was the reward to which Montgomery thought himself entitled. But the Episcopalians and the moderate Presbyterians dreaded him as a man of extreme opinions and of bitter spirit. He had been a chief of the Covenanters, he had been prosecuted at one time for holding conventicles, and at another time for harboring rebels. He had been fined, he had been imprisoned, he had been almost driven to take refuge from his enemies beyond the Atlantic in the infant settlement of New Jersey. It was apprehended that, if he were now armed with the whole power of the crown, he would exact a terrible retribution for what he had suffered. William, therefore, preferred Melville, who, though not a man of eminent talents, was regarded by the Presbyterians as a thoroughgoing friend, and not yet regarded by the Episcopalians as an implacable enemy. Melville fixed his residence at the English court, and became the regular organ of communication between Kensington and the authorities at Edinburgh. William had, however, one Scottish adviser who deserved and possessed more influence than any of the ostensible ministers. This was Carstairs, one of the most remarkable men of that age. He united great scholastic attainments, with great aptitude for civil business, and the firm faith and ardent zeal of a martyr, with the shrewdness and suppleness of a consummate politician. In courage and fidelity he resembled Burnet, but he had what Burnet wanted, judgment, self-command, and a singular power of keeping secrets. There was no post to which he might not have aspired if he had been a layman or a priest of the Church of England. But a Presbyterian clergyman could not hope to attain any high dignity, either in the north or in the south of the island. Carstairs was forced to content himself with the substance of power, and to leave the semblance to others. He was named chaplain to their majesties for Scotland, but wherever the king was, in England, in Ireland, in the Netherlands, there was this most trusty and most prudent of courtiers. He obtained from the royal bounty a modest competence, and he desired no more. But it was well known that he could be as useful a friend and as formidable an enemy as any member of the cabinet, 
and he was designated at the public offices and in the antechambers of the palace by the significant nickname of the Cardinal. To Montgomery was offered the place of Lord Justice Clerk. But that place, though high and honourable, he thought below his merits and his capacity, and he returned from London to Scotland with a heart ulcerated by hatred of his ungrateful master and of his successful rivals. At Edinburgh a knot of Whigs, as severely disappointed as himself by the new arrangements, readily submitted to the guidance of so bold and able a leader. Under his direction these men, among whom the Earl of Annandale and Lord Ross were the most conspicuous, formed themselves into a society called the Club, appointed a clerk, and met daily at a tavern to concert plans of opposition. Round this nucleus soon gathered a great body of greedy and angry politicians. With these dishonest malcontents, whose object was merely to annoy the government and to get places, were leaguered other malcontents, who, in the course of a long resistance to tyranny, had become so perverse and irritable that they were unable to live contentedly, even under the mildest and most constitutional government. Such a man was Sir Patrick Hume. He had returned from exile, as litigious, as impracticable, as morbidly jealous of all superior authority, and as fond of haranguing as he had been four years before, and was as much bent on making a merely nominal sovereign of William as he had been formerly bent on making a merely nominal general of Argyle. A man far superior morally and intellectually to Hume, Fletcher of Salton, belonging to the same party. Though not a member of the convention, he was a most active member of the club. He hated monarchy, he hated democracy. His favorite project was to make Scotland an oligarchical republic. The king, if there must be a king, was to be a mere pageant. The lowest class of the people were to be bondsmen. The whole power, legislative and executive, was to be in the hands of Parliament. In other words, the country was to be absolutely governed by a hereditary aristocracy, the most needy, the most haughty, and the most quarrelsome in Europe. Under such a polity there could have been neither freedom nor tranquillity. Trade, industry, science would have languished, and Scotland would have been a smaller Poland, with a puppet sovereign, a turbulent diet, and an enslaved people. With unsuccessful candidates for office, and with honest but wrong-headed Republicans, were mingled politicians, whose course was determined merely by fear. Many sycophants, who were conscious that they had, in the evil time, done what deserved punishment, were desirous to make their peace with the powerful and vindictive club, and were glad to be permitted to atone for their servility to James by their opposition to William. The great body of Jacobites, meanwhile, stood aloof saw with delight the enemies of the House of Stuart divided against one another, and indulged the hope that the confusion would end in the restoration of the banished king. While Montgomery was laboring to form, out of various materials, a party which might, when the convention should reassemble, be powerful enough to dictate to the throne, an enemy still more formidable than Montgomery had set up the standard of civil war in a region about which the politicians of Westminster, and indeed most of the politicians of Edinburgh, knew no more than about Abyssinia or Japan. It is not easy for a modern Englishman, who can pass in a day from his club in St. James's Street to his shooting-box among the Grampians, and who finds in his shooting-box all the comforts and luxuries of his club, to believe that, in the time of his great-grandfathers, St. James's Street had as little connection with the Grampians as with the Andes. Yet so it was. In the south of our island scarcely anything was known about the Celtic part of Scotland, and what was known excited no feeling but contempt and loathing. The crags and the glens, the woods and the waters, were indeed the same that now swarm every autumn with admiring gazers and stretchers. The trossachs wound as now between gigantic walls of rock, tapestried with broom and wild roses. Foyers came headlong down through the birch wood with the same leap and the same roar with which he still rushes to Loch Ness, and, in defiance of the sun of June, the snowy scalp of Ben Crocken rose, as it still rises, over the willowy islets of Loch Ow. Yet none of these sights had power, till a recent period, to attract a single poet or painter from more opulent and more tranquil regions. Indeed, law and police, trade and industry, have done far more than people of romantic dispositions will readily admit, to develop in our minds a sense of the wilder beauties of nature. 
a traveller must be freed from all apprehension of being murdered or starved before he can be charmed by the bold outlines and rich tints of the hills. He is not likely to be thrown into ecstasies by the abruptness of a precipice from which he is in imminent danger of falling two thousand feet perpendicular, by the boiling waves of a torrent which suddenly whirls away his baggage and forces him to run for his life, by the gloomy grandeur of a pass where he finds a corpse which marauders have just stripped and mangled, or by the screams of those eagles whose next meal may probably be on his own eyes. About the year 1730, Captain Burt, one of the first Englishmen who caught a glimpse of the spots which now allure tourists from every part of the civilized world, wrote an account of his wanderings. He was evidently a man of a quick, an observant, and a cultivated mind, and would doubtless, had he lived in our age, have looked with mingled awe and delight on the mountains of Invernessshire. He pronounced those mountains monstrous excrescences. Their deformity, he said, was such that the most sterile plains seemed lovely by comparison. Fine weather, he complained, only made bad worse, for the clearer the day, the more disagreeable did those misshapen masses of gloomy brown and dirty purple affect the eye. What a contrast, he exclaimed, between those horrible prospects and the beauties of Richmond Hill! Some persons may think that Bert was a man of vulgar and prosaical mind, but they will scarcely venture to pass a similar judgment on Oliver Goldsmith. Goldsmith was one of the very few Saxons who, more than a century ago, ventured to explore the highlands. He was disgusted by the hideous wilderness, and declared that he greatly preferred the charming country around Leyden, the vast expanse of verdant meadow, and the villas, with their statues and grottoes, trim flower-beds, and rectilinear avenues. Yet it is difficult to believe that the author of The Traveller and of The Deserted Village was naturally inferior in taste and sensibility to the thousands of clerks and milliners who are now thrown into raptures by the sight of Loch Katrine and Loch Lomond. His feelings may be easily explained. It was not till roads had been cut out of the rocks, till bridges had been flung over the courses of the rivulets, till inns had succeeded to dens of robbers, till there was as little danger of being slain or plundered in the wildest defile of Badenoch or Lochaber as in Cornhill, that strangers could be enchanted by the blue dimples of the lakes, and by the rainbows which overhung the waterfalls, and could derive a solemn pleasure even from the clouds and tempests which lowered on the mountain-tops. The change in the feeling with which the lowlanders regarded the highland scenery was closely connected with a change not less remarkable in the feeling with which they regarded the highland race. It was not strange that the wild Scotch, as they were sometimes called, should, in the seventeenth century, have been considered by the Saxons as mere savages. But it is surely strange that, considered as savages, they should not have been objects of interest and curiosity. The English were then abundantly inquisitive about the manners of rude nations, separated from our island by great continents and oceans. Numerous books were printed describing the laws, the superstitions, the cabins, the repasts, the dresses, the marriages, the funerals of Laplanders and Hottentots, Mohawks and Malays. The plays and poems of that age are full of allusions to the usages of the black men of Africa and of the red men of America. The only barbarian about whom there was no wish to have any information was the Highlander. Five or six years after the Revolution, an indefatigable angler published an account of Scotland. He boasted that, in the course of his rambles, from lake to lake, and from brook to brook, he had left scarcely a nook of the kingdom unexplored. We find that he had never ventured beyond the extreme skirts of the Celtic region. He tells us that even from the people who lived close to the passes he could learn little or nothing about the Gaelic population. Few Englishmen, he says, had ever seen Inverary. All beyond Inverary was chaos. In the reign of George I, a work was published which professed to give a most exact account of Scotland, and in this work, consisting of more than three hundred pages, two contemptuous paragraphs were thought sufficient for the Highlands and the Highlanders. We may well doubt whether, in 1689, one in twenty of the well-read gentlemen who assembled at Wills's coffee-house knew that, within the four seas, and at the distance of less than five hundred miles from London, were many miniature courts, in each of which a petty prince, attended by guards, by armor-bearers, by musicians, by a hereditary orator, by a hereditary poet laureate, kept a rude state, dispensed a rude justice, waged wars, and concluded treaties. 
While the old Gaelic institutions were in full vigour, no account of them was given by any observer, qualified to judge of them fairly. Had such an observer studied the character of the Highlanders, he would doubtless have found in it closely intermingled the good and the bad qualities of an uncivilized nation. He would have found that the people had no love for their country or for their king, that they had no attachment to any commonwealth larger than the clan, or to any magistrate superior to the chief. He would have found that life was governed by a code of morality and honor widely different from that which is established in peaceful and prosperous societies. He would have learned that a stab in the back, or a shot from behind a fragment of rock, were approved modes of taking satisfaction for insults. He would have heard men relate boastfully how they or their fathers had wreaked on hereditary enemies in a neighboring valley such vengeance as would have made old soldiers of the Thirty Years' War shudder. He would have found that robbery was held to be a calling, not merely innocent, but honorable. He would have seen, wherever he turned, that dislike of steady industry, and that disposition to throw on the weaker sex the heaviest part of manual labor, which are characteristic of savages. He would have been struck by the spectacle of athletic men basking in the sun, angling for salmon, or taking aim at grouse, while their aged mothers, their pregnant wives, their tender daughters, were reaping the scanty harvest of oats. Nor did the women repine at their hard lot. In their view it was quite fit that a man, especially if he assumed the aristocratic title of June Vossel and adorned his bonnet with the eagle's feather, should take his ease, except when he was fighting, hunting, or marauding. To mention the name of such a man in connection with commerce or with any mechanical art was an insult. Agriculture was, indeed, less despised. Yet a high-born warrior was much more becomingly employed in plundering the land of others than in tilling his own. The religion of the greater part of the Highlanders was a rude mixture of popery and paganism. The symbol of redemption was associated with heathen sacrifices and incantations. Baptized men poured libations of ale to one daemon, and set out drink-offerings of milk for another. Seers wrapped themselves up in bull's hides, and awaited, in that vesture, the inspiration which was to reveal the future. Even among those minstrels and genealogists whose hereditary vocation was to preserve the memory of past events, an inquirer would have found very few who could read. In truth, he might have easily journeyed from sea to sea without discovering a page of Gaelic printed or written. The price which he would have had to pay for his knowledge of the country would have been heavy. He would have had to endure hardships as great as if he had been sojourning among the Esquimaux or the Samoyeds. Here and there, indeed, at the castle of some great lord who had a seat in the Parliament and Privy Council, and who was accustomed to pass a large part of his life in the cities of the South, might have been found wigs and embroidered coats, plate and fine linen, lace and jewels, French dishes and French wines. But in general the traveller would have been forced to content himself with very different quarters. In many dwellings the furniture, the food, the clothing, nay, the very hair and skin of his hosts, would have put his philosophy to the proof. His lodging would sometimes have been in a hut of which every nook would have swarmed with vermin. He would have inhaled an atmosphere thick with peat smoke, and foul with a hundred noisome exhalations. At supper, grain fit only for horses would have been set before him, accompanied by a cake of blood drawn from living cows. Some of the company with which he would have feasted would have been covered with cutaneous eruptions, and others would have been smeared with tar like sheep. His couch would have been the bare earth, dry or wet as the weather might be, and from that couch he would have risen half poisoned with stench, half blind with the reek of turf, and half mad with the itch. This is not an attractive picture and yet an enlightened and dispassionate observer would have found in the character and manners of this rude people something which might well excite admiration and a good hope. Their courage was what great exploits achieved in all the four quarters of the globe have since proved it to be. Their intense attachment to their own tribe and to their own patriarch, though politically a great evil, partook of the nature of virtue. The sentiment was misdirected and ill-regulated, but still it was heroic. There must be some elevation of soul in a man who loves the society of which he is a member, and the leader whom he follows, with a love stronger than the love of life. It was true that the Highlander had few scruples about shedding the blood of an enemy, but it was not less true that he had high notions of the duty of observing faith to allies and hospitality to guests. 
it was true that his predatory habits were most pernicious to the commonwealth. Yet those erred greatly who imagined that he bore any resemblance to villains who, in rich and well-governed communities, live by stealing. When he drove before him the herds of lowland farmers up the pass which led to his native glen, he no more considered himself as a thief than the Raleighs and Drakes considered themselves as thieves when they divided the cargoes of Spanish galleons. He was a warrior, seizing lawful prize of war, of war never once intermitted during the thirty-five generations which had passed away since the Teutonic invaders had driven the children of the soil to the mountains. That, if he was caught robbing on such principles, he should, for the protection of peaceful industry, be punished with the utmost rigor of the law was perfectly just. But it was not just to class him morally with the pickpockets who infested Drury Lane Theatre, or the highwaymen who stopped coaches on Blackheath. His inordinate pride of birth and his contempt for labor and trade were indeed great weaknesses, and had done far more than the inclemency of the air and the sterility of the soil to keep his country poor and rude. Yet even here there was some compensation. It must in fairness be acknowledged that the patrician virtues were not less widely diffused among the population of the highlands than the patrician vices. As there was no other part of the island where men, sordidly clothed, lodged, and fed, indulged themselves to such a degree in the idle, sauntering habits of an aristocracy, so there was no other part of the island where such men had, in such a degree, the better qualities of an aristocracy, grace and dignity of manner, of self-respect, and that noble sensibility which makes dishonor more terrible than death. A gentleman of this sort, whose clothes were begrimed with the accumulated filth of years, and whose hovel smelt worse than an English hogsty, would often do the honors of that hovel with a lofty courtesy worthy of the splendid circle of Versailles. Though he had as little book-learning as the most stupid ploughboys of England, it would have been a great error to put him in the same intellectual rank with such ploughboys. It is indeed only by reading that men can become profoundly acquainted with any science. But the arts of poetry and rhetoric may be carried near to absolute perfection, and may exercise a mighty influence on the public mind, in an age in which books are wholly or almost wholly unknown. The first great painter of life and manners has described, with a vivacity which makes it impossible to doubt that he was copying from nature, the effect produced by eloquence and song on audiences ignorant of the alphabet. It is probable that, in the Highland councils, men who would not have been qualified for the duty of parish clerks sometimes argued questions of peace and war, of tribute and homage, with ability worthy of Halifax and Carmarthen, and that at the Highland banquets, minstrels who did not know their letters sometimes poured forth rhapsodies, in which a discerning critic might have found passages which would have reminded him of the tenderness of Otway, or of the vigor of Dryden. There was therefore even then evidence sufficient to justify the belief that no natural inferiority had kept the Celt far behind the Saxon. It might safely have been predicted that, if ever an efficient police should make it impossible for the Highlander to avenge his wrongs by violence, and to supply his wants by rapine, if ever his faculties should be developed by the civilizing influence of the Protestant religion and of the English language, if ever he should transfer to his country and to her lawful magistrates the affection and respect with which he had been taught to regard his own petty community and his own petty prince, the kingdom would obtain an immense accession of strength for all the purposes both of peace and of war. Such would doubtless have been the decision of a well-informed and impartial judge. But no such judge was then to be found. The Saxons, who dwelt far from the Gaelic provinces, could not be well-informed. The Saxons who dwelt near those provinces could not be impartial. National enmities have always been fiercest among borderers, and the enmity between the highland border and the lowland borderer, on the whole frontier, was the growth of ages, and was kept fresh by constant injuries. One day many square miles of pasture-land were swept bare by armed plunderers from the hills. Another day a score of plaids dangling in a row on the gallows of Creef or Stirling, Fairs were indeed held on the debatable land for the necessary interchange of commodities, but to those fairs both parties came prepared for battle, and the day often ended in bloodshed. Thus the Highlander was an object of hatred to his Saxon neighbors, and from his Saxon neighbors those Saxons who dwelt far from him learned the very little that they cared to know about his habits. When the English condescended to think of him at all, and it was seldom that they did so, 
they considered him as a filthy, abject savage, a slave, a papist, a cutthroat, and a thief. This contemptuous loathing lasted till the year 1745, and was then for a moment succeeded by intense fear and rage. England, thoroughly alarmed, put forth her whole strength. The Highlands were subjugated rapidly, completely, and forever. During a short time the English nation, still heated by the recent conflict, breathed nothing but vengeance. The slaughter on the field of battle and on the scaffold was not sufficient to slake the public thirst for blood. The sight of the tartan inflamed the populace of London with hatred, which showed itself by unmanly outrages to defenceless captives. A political and social revolution took place through the whole Celtic region. The power of the chiefs was destroyed, the people were disarmed, the use of the old national garb was interdicted, the old predatory habits were effectually broken, and scarcely had this change been accomplished when a strange reflux of public feeling began. Pity succeeded to aversion. The nation execrated the cruelties which had been committed on the Highlanders, and forgot that for those cruelties it was itself answerable. Those very Londoners who, while the memory of the march to Derby was still fresh, had thronged to hoot and pelt the rebel prisoners, now fastened on the prince who had put down the rebellion the nickname of Butcher. Those barbarous institutions and usages, which, while they were in full force, no Saxon had thought worthy of serious examination, or had mentioned, except with contempt, had no sooner ceased to exist than they become the objects of curiosity, of interest, even of admiration. Scarcely had the chiefs been turned into mere landlords, when it became the fashion to draw invidious comparisons between the rapacity of the landlord and the indulgence of the chief. Men seemed to have forgotten that the ancient Gaelic polity had been found to be incompatible with the authority of law, had obstructed the progress of civilization, had more than once brought on the empire the curse of civil war. As they had formerly seen only the odious side of that polity, they could now see only the pleasing side. The old tie, they said, had been parental. The new tie was purely commercial. What could be more lamentable than that the head of a tribe should eject, for a paltry arrear of rent, tenants who were his own flesh and blood, tenants whose forefathers had often with their bodies covered his forefathers on the field of battle? As long as there were Gaelic marauders, they had been regarded by the Saxon population as hateful vermin who ought to be exterminated without mercy. As soon as the extermination had been accomplished, as soon as cattle were as safe in the Perthshire passes as in the Smithfield market, the freebooter was exalted into a hero of romance. As long as the Gaelic dress was worn, the Saxons had pronounced it hideous, ridiculous, nay, grossly indecent. Soon after it had been prohibited, they discovered that it was the most graceful drapery in Europe. The Gaelic monuments, the Gaelic usages, the Gaelic superstitions, the Gaelic verses, disdainfully neglected during many ages, began to attract the attention of the learned from the moment at which the peculiarities of the Gaelic race began to disappear. So strong was the impulse that, where the highlands were concerned, men of sense gave ready credence to stories without evidence, and men of taste gave rapturous applause to compositions without merit. Epic poems, which any skilful and dispassionate critic would at a glance have perceived to be almost entirely modern, and which, if they had been published as modern, would have instantly found their proper place in company with Blackmore's Alfred and Wilkie's Eponyard, were pronounced to be fifteen hundred years old, and were gravely classed with the Iliad. Writers of a very different order, from the impostor who fabricated these forgeries, saw how striking an effect might be produced by skilful pictures of the old Highland life. Whatever was repulsive was softened down, whatever was graceful and noble was brought prominently forward. Some of these works were executed with such admirable art that, like the historical plays of Shakespeare, they superseded history. The versions of the poet were realities to his readers. The places which he described became holy ground, and were visited by thousands of pilgrims. Soon the vulgar imagination was so completely occupied by plaids, targets, and claymores, that by most Englishmen, Scotchman and Highlander were regarded as synonymous words. Few people seemed to be aware that, at no remote period, a MacDonald or a MacGregor in his tartan was to a citizen of Edinburgh or Glasgow what an Indian hunter in his war-paint is to an inhabitant of Philadelphia or Boston. Artists and actors represented Bruce and Douglas in striped petticoats. 
they might as well have represented Washington brandishing a tomahawk, and girt with a string of scalps. At length this fashion reached a point beyond which it was not easy to proceed. The last British king who held a court at Holyrood thought that he could not give a more striking proof of his respect for the usages which had prevailed in Scotland before the Union, than by disguising himself in what, before the Union, was considered by nine Scotchmen out of ten as the dress of a thief. Thus it has chanced that the old Gaelic institutions and manners have never been exhibited in a simple light of truth. Up to the middle of the last century they were seen through one false medium. They have since been seen through another. Once they loomed dimly through an obscuring and distorting haze of prejudice, and no sooner had that fog dispersed than they appeared bright with all the richest tints of poetry. The time when a perfectly fair picture could have been painted has now passed away. The original has long disappeared. No authentic effigy exists, and all that is possible to produce an imperfect likeness by the help of two portraits, one of which is a coarse caricature and the other a masterpiece of flattery. Among the most erroneous notions which have been commonly received concerning the history and character of the Highlanders is one which it is especially necessary to correct. During the century which commenced with the campaign of Montrose, and terminated with the campaign of the Young Pretender, every great military exploit which was achieved on British ground in the cause of the House of Stuart was achieved by the valour of Gaelic tribes. The English have therefore very naturally ascribed to those tribes the feelings of English cavaliers, profound reverence for the royal office, and enthusiastic attachment to the royal family. A close inquiry, however, will show that the strength of these feelings among the Celtic clans has been greatly exaggerated. End of chapter 13, part 6of England. Chapter 13, Part 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of England, from the Accession of James the Second, by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 13, Part 7. In studying the history of our civil contentions, we must never forget that the same names, badges, and war cries had very different meanings in different parts of the British Isles. We have already seen how little there was in common between the Jacobitism of Ireland and the Jacobitism of England. The Jacobitism of the Scotch Highlander was, at least in the seventeenth century, a third variety quite distinct from the other two. The Gaelic population was far indeed from holding the doctrines of passive obedience and non-resistance. In fact, disobedience and resistance made up the ordinary life of that population. Some of those very clans which it had been the fashion to describe as so enthusiastically loyal that they were prepared to stand by James to the death even when he was in the wrong, had never, while he was on the throne, paid the slightest respect to his authority, even when he was clearly in the right. Their practice, their calling, had been to disobey and to defy him. Some of them had actually been proscribed by sound of horn for the crime of withstanding his lawful commands, and would have torn to pieces without scruple any of his officers who had dared to venture beyond the passes for the purpose of executing his warrant. The English Whigs were accused by their opponents of holding doctrines dangerously lax, touching the obedience due to the chief magistrate. Yet no respectable English Whig ever defended rebellion, except as a rare and extreme remedy for rare and extreme evils, but among those Celtic chiefs whose loyalty has been the theme of so much warm eulogy were some whose whole existence from boyhood upwards had been one long rebellion. Such men, it is evident, were not likely to see the revolution in the same light in which it appears to an Oxonian non-juror. On the other hand, they were not, like the aboriginal Irish, 
urged to take arms by impatience of Saxon domination. To such domination the Scottish Celt had never been subjected. He occupied his own wild and sterile region, and followed his own national usages. In his dealings with the Saxons he was rather the oppressor than the oppressed. He exacted blackmail from them, he drove away their flocks and herds, and they seldom dared to pursue him to his native wilderness. They had never portioned out among themselves his dreary region of moor and shingle. He had never seen the tower of his hereditary chieftains, occupied by an usurper who could not speak Gaelic, and who looked on all who spoke it as brutes and slaves. Nor had his national and religious feelings ever been outraged by the power and splendor of a church which he regarded as at once foreign and heretical. The real explanation of the readiness with which a large part of the population of the highlands, twice in the seventeenth century, drew the sword for the Stuarts, is to be found in the internal quarrels which divided the commonwealth of clans. For there was a commonwealth of clans, the image on a reduced scale, of the great commonwealths of European nations. In the smaller of these two commonwealths, as in the larger, there were wars, treaties, alliances, disputes about territory and precedence, a system of public law, a balance of power. There was one inexhaustible source of discontents and disputes. The feudal system had, some centuries before, been introduced into the hill country, but had neither destroyed the patriarchal system, nor amalgamated completely with it. In general, he who was lord in the Norman polity was also chief in the Celtic polity, and when this was the case there was no conflict. But when the two characters were separated, all the willing and loyal obedience was reserved for the chief. The lord had only what he could get in hold by force, if he was able, by the help of his own tribe, to keep in subjection tenants who were not of his own tribe, there was a tyranny of clan over clan, the most galling, perhaps, of all forms of tyranny. At different times different races had risen to an authority which had produced general fear and envy. The Macdonalds had once possessed, in the Hebrides and throughout the mountain country of Argyllshire and Invernessshire, an ascendancy similar to that which the House of Austria had once possessed in Christendom. But the ascendancy of the Macdonalds had, like the ascendancy of the House of Austria, passed away, and the Campbells, the children of Diarmid, had become in the Highlands what the Bourbons had become in Europe. The parallel might be carried far, imputation similar to those which it was the fashion to throw on the French government were thrown on the Campbells. A peculiar dexterity, a peculiar plausibility of address, a peculiar contempt for all the obligations of good faith were ascribed, with or without reason, to the dreaded race. Fair and false like a Campbell became a proverb. It was said that Macallum Moore after Macallum Moore had, with unwearied, unscrupulous, and unrelenting ambition, annexed mountain after mountain and island after island to the original domains of his house. Some tribes had been expelled from their territory, some compelled to pay tribute, some incorporated with the conquerors. At length the number of fighting men who bore the name of Campbell was sufficient to meet in the field of battle the combined forces of all the other western clans. It was during those civil troubles which commenced in 1638 that the power of this aspiring family reached the zenith. The Marquess of Argyll was at the head of a party as well as at the head of a tribe. Possessed of two different kinds of authority, he used each of them in such a way as to extend and fortify the other. The knowledge that he could bring into the field the claymores of five thousand half-heathen mountaineers added to his influence among the austere Presbyterians 
who filled the Privy Council and the General Assembly at Edinburgh. His influence at Edinburgh added to the terror which he inspired among the mountains. Of all the Highland princes, whose history is well known to us, he was the greatest and most dreaded. It was while his neighbors were watching the increase of his power with hatred, which fear could scarcely keep down, that Montrose called them to arms. The call was promptly obeyed. A powerful coalition of clans waged war, nominally for King Charles, but really against Macallum Moore. It is not so easy for any person who has studied the history of that contest to doubt that if Argyle had supported the cause of monarchy, his neighbors would have declared against it. Grave writers tell of the victory gained at Inverlochy by the royalists over the rebels, but the peasants who dwell near the spot speak more accurately. They talk of the great battle won there by the Macdonalds over the Campbells. The feelings which had produced the coalition against the Marquess of Argyle retained their force long after his death. His son, Earl Archibald, though a man of many eminent virtues, inherited, with the ascendancy of his accession, the unpopularity which such ascendancy could scarcely fail to produce. In 1675, several warlike tribes formed a confederacy against him, but were compelled to submit to the superior force which was at his command. There was, therefore, great joy from sea to sea, when, in 1681, he was arraigned on a futile charge, condemned to death, driven into exile, and deprived of his dignities. There was great alarm when, in 1685, he returned from banishment, and sent forth the fiery cross to summon his kinsmen to his standard, and there was again great joy, when his enterprise had failed, when his army had melted away, when his head had been fixed on the tollbooth of Edinburgh, and when those chiefs who had regarded him as an oppressor had obtained from the crown, on easy terms, remissions of old debts and grants of new titles. While England and Scotland generally were execrating the tyranny of James, he was honored as a deliverer in Appin and Lochaber, in Glenroy and Glenmore. The hatred excited by the power and ambition of the House of Argyle was not satisfied even when the head of that house had perished, when his children were fugitives, when strangers garrisoned the castle of Inverary, and when the whole shore of Loch Finn was laid waste by fire and sword. It was said that the terrible precedent which had been set in the case of the MacGregors, ought to be followed, that it ought to be made a crime, to bear the odious name of Campbell. On a sudden all was changed. The revolution came. The heir of Argyle returned in triumph. He was, as his predecessors had been, at the head not only of a tribe, but of a party. The sentence, which had deprived him of his estate and of his honors, was treated by the majority of the convention as a nullity. The doors of the Parliament House were thrown open to him. He was selected from the whole body of Scottish nobles to administer the oath of office to the new sovereigns, and he was authorized to raise an army on his domains for the service of the crown. He would now, doubtless, be as powerful as the most powerful of his ancestors. Backed by the strength of the government, he would demand all the long and heavy arrears of rent and tribute which were due to him from his neighbors, and would exact revenge for all the injuries and insults which his family had suffered. There was terror and agitation in the castles of twenty petty kings. The uneasiness was great among the Stuarts of Appin, whose territory was close pressed by the sea on one side and by the race of Diarmid on the other. The Macnattans were still more alarmed. Once they had been the masters of those beautiful valleys through which the Ara and the Shira flow into Loch Finn, but the Campbells had prevailed. The Macnattans had been reduced to subjection and had, generation after generation, looked up with awe and detestation to the neighboring castle of Inverary.
they had recently been promised a complete emancipation, a grant by virtue of which their chief would have held his estate immediately from the crown, had been prepared, and was about to pass the seals, when the revolution suddenly extinguished a hope which amounted almost to certainty. The Maclean's remembered that, only fourteen years before, their lands had been invaded and the seat of their chief taken and garrisoned by the Campbells. Even before William and Mary had been proclaimed at Edinburgh, a Maclean, deputed doubtless by the head of his tribe, had crossed the sea to Dublin, and had assured James that, if two or three battalions from Ireland were landed in Argyllshire, they would be immediately joined by four thousand four hundred claymores. A similar spirit animated the Camerons. Their ruler, Sir Ewan Cameron of Lochiel, surnamed the Black, was in personal qualities unrivaled among the Celtic princes. He was a gracious master, a trusty ally, a terrible enemy. His countenance and bearing were singularly noble. Some persons who had been at Versailles, and among them the shrewd and observant Simon Lord Lovat, said that there was, in person and manner, a most striking resemblance between Louis the Fourteenth and Lochiel, and whoever compares the portraits of the two will perceive that there really was some likeness. In stature the difference was great. Louis, in spite of his high-heeled shoes and a towering wig, hardly reached the middle size. Lochiel was tall and strongly built. In agility and skill at his weapons he had few equals among the inhabitants of the hills. He had repeatedly been victorious in single combat. He was a hunter of great fame. He made vigorous war on the wolves, which, down to his time, preyed on the red deer of the Grampians, and by his hand perished the last of the ferocious breed which is known to have wandered at large in our island. Nor was Lochiel less distinguished by intellectual than by bodily vigor. He might indeed have seemed ignorant to educated and travelled Englishmen, who had studied the classics under Busby at Westminster, under Aldrich at Oxford, who had learned something about the sciences among the fellows of the Royal Society, and something about the fine arts in the galleries of Florence and Rome. But, though Lochiel had very little knowledge of books, he was eminently wise in counsel, eloquent in debate, ready in devising expedients, and skillful in managing the minds of men. His understanding preserved him from those follies into which pride and anger frequently hurried his brother chieftains. Many, therefore, who regarded his brother chieftains as mere barbarians, mentioned him with respect. Even at the Dutch embassy in St. James's Square, he was spoken of as a man of such capacity and courage that it would not be easy to find his equal. As a patron of literature, he ranks with a magnificent Dorset. If Dorset, out of his own purse, allowed Dryden a pension equal to the profits of the lartership, Lochiel is said to have bestowed on a celebrated bard who had been plundered by marauders and who implored alms in pathetic Gaelic ode three cows and the almost incredible sum of fifteen pounds sterling. In truth, the character of this great chief was depicted two thousand five hundred years before his birth and depicted such as the power of genius in colors which will be fresh as many years after his death, he was the Ulysses of the Highlands. He held a large territory, peopled by a race, which reverenced no lord, no king, but himself. For that territory, however, he owed homage to the house of Argyle. He was bound to assist his feudal superiors in war, and was deeply in debt to them for rent. This vassalage he had doubtless been early taught to consider as degrading and unjust. In his minority he had been the ward in chivalry of the politic Marquess, and had been educated at the castle of Inverary.
but at eighteen the boy broke loose from the authority of his guardian and fought bravely both for charles the first and for charles the second he was therefore considered by the english as a cavalier was well received at whitehall after the restoration and was knighted by the hand of james the compliment however which was paid to him on one of his appearances at the english court would not have seemed very flattering to a saxon take care of your pockets my lords cried his majesty here comes the king of the thieves the loyalty of lochiel is almost proverbial but it was very unlike what would be called loyalty in england in the records of the scottish parliament he was in the days of charles the second described as a lawless and rebellious man who held lands masterfully and in high contempt of the royal authority on one occasion the sheriff of inverness shire was directed by king james to hold a court at lochaber lochiel jealous of this interference with his own patriarchal despotism came to the tribunal at the head of four hundred armed camerons he affected great reverence for the royal commission but he dropped three or four words which were perfectly understood by the pages and armor-bearers who watched every turn of his eye is none of my lads so clever as to send this judge packing i have seen them get up a quarrel when there was less need of one in a moment a brawl began in the crowd none could say how or where hundreds of dirks were out cries of help and murder were raised on all sides many wounds were inflicted two men were killed the sitting broke up in tumult and the terrified sheriff was forced to put himself under the protection of the chief who with a plausible bow of respect and concern escorted him safe home it is amusing to think that the man who performed this feat is constantly extolled as the most faithful and dutiful subjects by writers who blame somers and burnett as contemners of the legitimate authority of sovereigns lochiel would undoubtedly have laughed the doctrine of non-resistance to scorn but scarcely any chief in inverness shire had gained more than he by the downfall of the house of argyle or had more reason than he to dread the restoration of that house scarcely any chief in inverness shire therefore was more alarmed and disgusted by the proceedings of the convention but of all those highlanders who looked on the recent turn of fortune with painful apprehension the fiercest and the most powerful were the macdonalds more than one of the magnates who bore that widespread name laid claim to the honor of being the rightful successor of those lords of the isles who as late as the fifteenth century disputed the preeminence of the kings of scotland this genealogical controversy which has lasted down to our own time caused much bickering among the competitors but they all agreed in regretting the past splendor of their dynasty and in detesting the upstart race of campbell the old feud had never slumbered it was still constantly repeated in verse and prose that the finest part of the domain belonged to the ancient heads of the gaelic nation hisley where they had lived with the pomp of royalty iona where they had been in turn with the pomp of religion the paps of jura the rich peninsula of kintyre had been transferred from the legitimate possessors to the insatiable Macallum Moore. Since the downfall of the House of Argyle, the Macdonalds, if they had not regained their ancient superiority, might at least boast that they had now no superior. Relieved from the fear of their mighty enemy in the west, they had turned their arms against weaker enemies in the east, against the clan of Mackintosh and against the town of Inverness. End of chapter 13, part 7《of England, chapter 13, part 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain.
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay, Chapter Thirteen, Part Eight. The clan of Mackintosh, a branch of an ancient and renowned tribe which took its name and badge from the wild cat of the forests, had a dispute with the Macdonalds, which originated, if tradition may be believed, in those dark times when the Danish pirates wasted the coasts of Scotland. Inverness was a Saxon colony among the Celts, a hive of traders and artisans in the midst of a population of loungers and plunderers, a solitary outpost of civilization in a region of barbarians. Though the buildings covered but a small part of the space over which they now extend, though the arrival of a brig in the port was a rare event, though the exchange was the middle of a miry street in which stood a market cross much resembling a broken milestone, though the sittings of the municipal council were held in a filthy den with a rough cast wall, though the best houses were such as now would be called hovels, though the best roofs were of thatch, though the best ceilings were of bare rafters, though the best windows were in bad weather, closed with shutters for want of glass, though the humbler dwellings were mere heaps of turf, in which barrels with the bottoms knocked out served the purpose of chimneys, yet to the mountaineer of the Grampians this city was as Babylon or as Tyre. Nowhere else had he seen four or five hundred houses, two churches, twelve maltkins crowded close together. Nowhere else had he been dazzled by the splendor of rows of booths, where knives, horn-spoons, tin kettles, and gouty ribbons were exposed to sale. Nowhere else had he been on board of one of those huge ships which brought sugar and wine over the sea from countries far beyond the limits of his geography. It is not strange that the haughty and warlike Macdonalds, despising peaceful industry, yet envying the fruits of that industry, should have fastened a succession of quarrels on the people of Inverness. In the reign of Charles the Second, it had been apprehended that the town would be stormed and plundered by those rude neighbors. The terms of peace which they offered showed how little they regarded the authority of the prince and of the law. Their demands, that a heavy tribute should be paid to them, that the municipal magistrates should bind themselves by an oath to deliver tip to the vengeance of the clan every burgher who should shed the blood of a Macdonald, and that every burgher who should anywhere meet a person wearing the Macdonald tartan should ground arms in token of submission. Never did Louis the Fourteenth, not even when he was encamped between Utrecht and Amsterdam, treat the States General with such despotic insolence. By the intervention of the Privy Council of Scotland, a compromise was effected, but the old animosity was undiminished. Common enmities and common apprehensions produced a good understanding between the town and the clan of the Mackintosh. The foe most hated and dreaded by both was Colin MacDonald of Keppoch, an excellent specimen of the genuine Highland Jacobite. Keppoch's whole life had been passing in insulting and resisting the authority of the crown. He had been repeatedly charged on his allegiance to desist from his lawless practices, but had treated every admonition with contempt. The government, however, was not willing to resort to extremes against him, and he long continued to rule the stormy peaks of Coryarrick and the gigantic terraces which still mark the limits of what was once the lake of Glenroy. He was famed for his knowledge of all the ravines and caverns of that dreary region, and such was the skill with which he could track a herd of cattle to the most secret hiding place that he was known by the nickname of Call of the Cows. At length his outrageous violations of all law compelled the Privy Council to take decided steps. He was proclaimed a rebel, Letters of fire and sword were issued against him under the seal of James, and, a few weeks before the revolution, a body of royal troops, supported by the whole strength of the Mackintoshes, marched into Keppoch's territories. He gave battle to the invaders, and was victorious. The king's forces were put to flight, 
the king's captain was slain, and this by a hero whose loyalty to the king many writers have very complacently contrasted with the factious turbulence of the Whigs. If Kepok had ever stood in any awe of the government, he was completely relieved from that feeling by the general anarchy which followed the revolution. He wasted the lands of the Mackintoshes, advanced to Inverness, and threatened the town with destruction. The danger was extreme. The houses were surrounded only by a wall, which time and weather had so loosened that it shook in every storm. Yet the inhabitants showed a bold front, and their courage was stimulated by their preachers. Sunday, the 28th of April, was a day of alarm and confusion. The savages went round and round the small colony of Saxons like a troop of famished wolves round a sheepfold. Kepok threatened and blustered. He would come in with all his men. He would sack the place. The burghers, meanwhile, mustered in arms round the market cross to listen to the oratory of their ministers. The day closed without an assault. The Monday and the Tuesday passed away in intense anxiety, and then an unexpected mediator made his appearance. Dundee, after his flight from Edinburgh, had retired to his country seat in that valley through which the Glamis descends to the ancient castle of Macbeth. Here he remained quiet during some time. He protested that he had no intention of opposing the new government. He declared himself ready to return to Edinburgh, if only he could be assured that he should be protected against lawless violence, and he offered to give his word of honor, or, if that were not sufficient, to give bail, that he would keep the peace. Some of his old soldiers had accompanied him, and formed a garrison sufficient to protect his house against the Presbyterians of the neighborhood. Here he might possibly have remained unharmed and harmless, had not an event for which he was not answerable made his enemies implacable and made him desperate. An emissary of James had crossed from Ireland to Scotland, with letters addressed to Dundee and Balcaras. Suspicion was excited. The messenger was arrested, interrogated and searched, and the letters were found. Some of them proved to be from Melfort, and were worthy of him. Every line indicated those qualities which had made him the aberrance of his country and the favorite of his master. He announced with delight the near approach of the day of vengeance and rapine, of the day when the estates of the seditious would be divided among the loyal, and when many who had been great and prosperous would be exiles and beggars. The king, Melfort said, was determined to be severe. Experience had at length convinced his majesty that mercy would be a weakness. Even the Jacobites were disgusted by learning that a restoration would be immediately followed by a confiscation and a proscription. Some of them did not hesitate to say that Melfort was a villain, that he hated Dundee and Balcaras, that he wished to ruin them, and that for that end he had written these odious despatches and had employed a messenger who had very dexterously managed to be caught. It is, however, quite certain that Melfort, after the publication of these papers, continued to stand as high as ever in the favor of James. It can therefore hardly be doubted that in those passages which shocked even the zealous supporters of hereditary right, the secretary merely expressed with fidelity the feelings and intentions of his master. Hamilton, by virtue of the powers which the estates had before their adjournment confined to him, ordered Balcaras and Dundee to be arrested. Balcaras was taken and confined, first in his own house, and then in the tollbooth of Edinburgh. But to seize Dundee was not so easy an enterprise. As soon as he heard that warrants were out against him, he crossed the Dee with his followers, and remained a short time in the wild domains of the house of Gordon. There he held some communications with the Macdonalds and Camerons about a rising, but he seems at this time to have known little and cared little about the Highlanders. For their national character, he probably felt the dislike of a Saxon. For their military character, the contempt of a professional soldier. He soon returned to the lowlands, and stayed there till he learnt that a considerable body of troops had been sent to apprehend him. He then betook himself to the hill country as his last refuge, pushed northward through Strathdon and Strathbogie, 
crossed the Spey, and on the morning of the 1st of May arrived with a small band of horsemen at the camp of Kepok before Inverness. The new situation in which Dundee was now placed, the new view of society which was presented to him, naturally suggested new projects to his inventive and enterprising spirit. The hundreds of athletic Celts whom he saw in their national order of battle were evidently not allies to be despised. If he could form a great coalition of clans, if he could muster under one banner ten or twelve thousand of those hardy warriors, if he could induce them to submit to their restraints of discipline, what a career might be before him. A commission from King James, even when King James was securely seated on the throne, had never been regarded with much respect by call of the cows. That chief, however, hated the Campbells with all the hatred of a Macdonald, and probably gave in his adhesion to the cause of the House of Stuart. Dundee undertook to settle the dispute between Keppoch and Inverness. The town agreed to pay two thousand dollars, a sum which, small as it might be in the estimation of the goldsmiths of Lombard Street, probably exceeded any treasure that had ever been carried into the wilds of Coryarrick. Half the sum was raised, not without difficulty, by the inhabitants, and Dundee is said to have passed his word for the remainder. He next tried to reconcile the Macdonalds with the Mackintoshes, and flattered himself that the two warlike tribes, lately arrayed against each other, might be willing to fight side by side under his command. But he soon found that it was no light matter to take up a highland feud. About the rights of the contending kings, neither clan knew anything or cared anything. The conduct of both is to be ascribed to local passions and interests. What Argyle was to Keppoch, Keppoch was to the Mackintoshes. The Mackintoshes therefore remained neutral, and their example was followed by the Macphersons, another branch of the race of the wild cat. This was not Dundee's only disappointment. The Mackenzies, the Frasers, the Grants, the Monroes, the Mackays, the Macleodes dwelt at a great distance from the territory of Macullam Moor. They had no dispute with him, they owed no debt to him, and they had no reason to dread the increase of his power. They therefore did not sympathize with his alarmed and exasperated neighbors, and could not be induced to join the confederacy against him. Those chiefs, on the other hand, who lived nearer to Inverary, and to whom the name of Campbell had long been terrible and hateful, greeted Dundee eagerly, and promised to meet him at the head of their followers on the 18th of May. During the fortnight which preceded that day, he traversed Badenoch and Athol, and exhorted the inhabitants of those districts to rise in arms. He dashed into the lowlands with his horsemen, surprised Perth, and carried off some Whig gentlemen prisoners to the mountains. Meanwhile the fiery crosses had been wandering from hamlet to hamlet over all the heaths and mountains thirty miles round Ben Nevis, and when he reached the trysting place in Lochaber he found that the gathering had begun. The headquarters were fixed close to Lochiel's house, a large pile built entirely of fir wood, and considered in the highlands as a superb place. Lochiel, surrounded by more than six hundred broadswords, was there to receive his guests. Macnaughton of Macnaughton and Stuart of Appin were at the muster with their little clans. Macdonald of Capoc led the warriors who had, a few months before, under his command, put to flight the musketeers of King James. Macdonald of Clanrenald was of tender years, but he was brought to the camp by his uncle, who acted at regent during the minority. The youth was attended by a picked bodyguard composed of his cousins, all comely in appearance, and good men of their hands. Macdonald of Glengarry, conspicuous by his dark brow and his lofty stature, came from the great valley where a chain of lakes, then unknown to fame, and scarcely set down in maps, is now the daily highway of steam vessels, pushing and reprising between the Atlantic and the German Ocean. None of the rulers of the mountains had a higher sense of his personal dignity, or was more frequently engaged in disputes with other chiefs. He generally affected in his manners and in his housekeeping a rudeness beyond that of his rude neighbors, and professed to regard the very few luxuries which had then found their way from the civilized parts of the world into the highlands as a sign of the effeminacy and degeneracy of the Gaelic race.
but on this occasion he chose to imitate the splendor of Saxon warriors, and rode on horseback before his four hundred plated clansmen in a steel cuirass and a coat embroidered with gold lace. Another MacDonald, destined to a lamentable and horrible end, led a band of hardy freebooters from the dreary pass of Glencoe. Somewhat later came the great Hebridean potentates, MacDonald of Sleet, the most opulent and powerful of all the grandees who laid claim to the lofty title of Lord of the Isles, arrived at the head of seven hundred fighting men from Skye. A fleet of long boats brought five hundred Maclean's from Mull under the command of their chief, Sir John of Duart. A far more formidable array had in old times followed his forefathers to battle, but the power, though not the spirit of the clan, had been broken by the arts and arms of the Campbells. Another band of Maclean's arrived under a valiant leader, who took his title from Lockby, which is, being interpreted, the Yellow Lake. It does not appear that a single chief who had not some special cause to dread and detest the House of Argyle obeyed Dundee's summons. There is indeed strong reason to believe that the chiefs who came would have remained quietly at home if the government had understood the politics of the highlands. Those politics were thoroughly understood by one able and experienced statesman sprung from the great highland family of Mackenzie, the Viscount Tarbay. He, at this conjuncture, pointed out to Melville by letter, and to Mackay in conversation, both the cause and the remedy of the distempers which seemed likely to bring on Scotland the calamities of civil war. There was, Tarbay said, no general disposition to insurrection among the gale. Little was to be apprehended even from those popish clans, which were under no apprehension of being subjected to the yoke of the Campbells. It was notorious that the ablest and most active of the discontented chiefs troubled themselves not at all about the question which were in dispute between the Whigs and the Tories. Lochiel in particular, whose eminent personal qualities made him the most important man among the mountaineers, cared no more for James than for William. If the Camerons, the Macdonalds, and the Macleans could be convinced that under the new government their estates and their dignities would be safe, if Macallum Moore would make some concessions, if their majesties would take on themselves the payment of some arrears of rent, Dundee might call the clans to arms, but he would call to little purpose. Five thousand pounds, Tarbay thought, would be sufficient to quiet all the Celtic magnates, and in truth, though that sum might seem ludicrously small to the politicians of Westminster, though it was not larger than the annual gains of the groom of the stole, or of the payment of the forces, it might well be thought immense by a barbarous potentate, who, while he ruled hundreds of square miles, and could bring hundreds of warriors into the field, had perhaps never had fifty guineas at once in his coffers. Though Tarbay was considered by the Scottish ministers of the new sovereigns as a very doubtful friend, his advice was not altogether neglected. It was resolved that overtures, such as he recommended, should be made to the malcontents, much depended on the choice of an agent, and unfortunately the choice showed how little prejudices of the wild tribes of the hills were understood at Edinburgh. A Campbell was selected for the office of gaining over to the cause of King William, men whose only quarrel to King William was that he countenanced the Campbells. Offers made through such a channel were naturally regarded as at once snares and insults. After this it was to no purpose, that Tarbay wrote to Lochiel and Mackay to Glengarry. Lochiel returned no answer to Tarbay, and Glengarry returned to Mackay a coldly civil answer, in which the general was advised to imitate the example of Monk. Mackay, meanwhile, wasted some weeks in marching, in countermarching, and in indecisive skirmishing. He afterwards honestly admitted that the knowledge which he had acquired during thirty years of military service on the continent was, in the new situation in which he was placed, useless to him. It was difficult in such a country to track the enemy. It was impossible to drive him to bay. Food for an invading army was not to be found in the wilderness of heath and shingle, nor could supplies for many days be transported far over quaking bogs and up precipitous ascents. The general found that he had tired his men and their horses almost to death, and yet had effected nothing. Highland auxiliaries might have been of the greatest use to him, 
but he had few such auxiliaries. The chief of the Grants, indeed, who had been persecuted by the late government, and had been accused of conspiring with the unfortunate Earl of Argyle, was zealous on the side of the revolution. Two hundred Mackays, animated probably by family feeling, came from the northern extremity of our island, where at midsummer there is no night to fight under a commander of their own name. But in general the clans which took no part in the insurrection awaited the event with cold indifference and pleased themselves with the hope that they should easily make their peace with the conquerors and be permitted to assist in plundering the conquered. An experience of little more than a month satisfied Mackay that there was only one way in which the highlands could be subdued. It was idle to run after the mountaineers up and down their mountains. A chain of fortresses must be built in the most important situations and must be well garrisoned. The place with which the general proposed to begin was Inverlochy, where the huge remains of an ancient castle stood and still stand. This post was close to an arm of the sea, and was in the heart of the country occupied by the discontented clans. A strong force stationed there and supported, if necessary, by ships of war, would effectually overawe at once the Macdonalds, the Camerons, and the Maclean's. While Mackay was representing in his letters to the council at Edinburgh the necessity of adopting this plan, Dundee was contending with difficulties which all his energy and dexterity could not completely overcome. The Highlanders, while they continued to be a nation living under a peculiar polity, were in one sense better and in another sense worse fitted for military purposes than any other nation in Europe. The individual Celt was morally and physically well qualified for war, and especially for war in so wild and rugged a country as his own. He was intrepid, strong, fleet, patient of cold, of hunger, and of fatigue. Up steep crags and over treacherous morasses he moved as easily as the French household troops paced along the great road from Versailles to Marly. He was accustomed to the use of weapons and to the sight of blood. He was a fencer, he was a marksman, and before he had ever stood in the ranks, he was already more than half a soldier. End of chapter 13, part 8